My friends, I have been on a journey of husbandry. I went primarily to see at first hand conditions in the drought state. To see how effectively federal and local authorities are taking care of pressing problems of relief and also how they are to work together to defend the people of this country against the effects of future drought. Thank you for joining me for another lecture on American history. This lecture will be on the Dust Bowl, 1930 to 1936. The Dust Bowl was the worst economic ecological disaster in US history. Due to the combined consequences of overfarming, the worst drought in North American history in 1,000 years, and the disastrous effects of the Great Depression. Several Southern Plains and Southwest states, along with Canadian regions, suffered what can best be described as an environmental and human tragedy of biblical proportions. For roughly six years, more than 100 million acres of land witnessed massive dust storms killing livestock, destroying farms and livelihoods, and even killing people, including many children who suffered the mortal blow of dust pneumonia. Roughly 2.5 million people left the Dust Bowl states during the 1930s. Dust Bowl refugees were called Okies at the time, a derisive name at the time a name of derision when first used in the 1930s. The Dust Bowl exodus would be the largest migration in American history, and indeed, one of the nation's greatest human dramas. Reasons for the Dust Bowl. Starting with World War I, U.S. wheat harvest demand boomed with new gasoline-powered tractors and the enticing reward of big payouts Farmers overplowed the Southern Plains. With the coming of the Great Depression, wheat prices crashed. Wheat dried up. The worst drought in North America in 1,000 years, coupled with abnormally high temperatures. No rain meant the drying of the earth, laying the foundation for the next reason overproduction of the land and poor farming practices that stripped away native grasses that naturally kept topsoil in place. Without native grasses holding topsoil down and with the perfect drought conditions des desiccating the land, Midwestern winds blew up dirt into massive dust storms. Here's a timeline. Um, not every date is in this timeline, but it gives, it gives you an idea. In 1931, severe drought hits the Midwestern and Southern Plains. As the crops die, black blizzards begin. begin. Dust from the, from the overplowed and overgrazed land begins to blow. 1932, the number of dust storms is increasing. 14 are reported this year. The next year, 1933, there will be 38 Dust, major dust storms. October 4th, 1933, in California's San Joaquin Valley, where many farmers fleeing the plains have gone seeking migrant farm work. The large, largest agricultural strike in America's history begins. More than 18,000 cotton workers, many of them Okies and Arkies, with the Cannery Agricultural Workers Industrial Union strike for 24 days. During the strike, two men and one woman is, are killed and hundreds injured. In the settlement, the union is recognized by growers and workers are given a 25% raise. May 1934, great dust storms spread from the Dust Bowl area. The drought is the worst ever in US history covering more than 75% of the country and affecting 27 states severely. A few more dates. April 14th, 1935, Black Sunday. The worst black blizzard of the Dust Bowl occurs, causing extensive damage. 
1936, 21% of all rural families in the Great Plains received federal emergency relief. In particular counties, the number was as high as 90%. February 1936, as Dust Bowl refugees are leaving um, all they've lost behind in states like Oklahoma, Arizona, Texas, Colorado, New Mexico, they're fleeing uh, mostly to California. Of course, only a small percentage of um, Dust Bowl residents leave. Um, most of stay behind in their states and, and wait it out. But those who do leave, most of them come to California, um, to the place where I, I live, um, the Central Valley. And at a particular moment when they attempt, when many of these people attempt to enter California, there are roadblocks. February 1936, Los Angeles Police Chief James E. Davis sends 125 policemen to patrol the borders of Arizona and Oregon to keep undesirables out, Dust Bowl refugees. These are Americans, um, not foreigners, but they're treated like foreigners. And many of the same things that, um, are, that are imputed to foreigners, like Mexicans over the 20th century, um, they're dirty, they bring, bring disease, There'll be a burden on the welfare system, on the jails, in the hospitals, um, and into society. And they're seen as a less, lesser type of citizen, even though they are American citizens. And they're treated with, um, in many cases, extreme prejudice. And when they come and try to find work, they do come dirty. They've lost everything. Um, some of them walk from Oklahoma. In one of my courses last semester, um, one of the young women in my class, when studying the Dust Bowl, interviewed her grandmother. Her grandmother was one of several children to a family in Oklahoma who couldn't provide for her. They left her behind in Oklahoma when she was 11 years old, abandoned her in Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl, the family fled to California, and she walked from Oklahoma at 11 years old, walked by herself to California. One of the greatest human, human dramas in American history, the Dust Bowl era. 1936, as a result of police chief James E. Davis blocking um, undesirables, American refugees from coming to California, the American, the ACLU, American Civil Rights, American Civil Liberties Union, sues the city of Los Angeles. January 20th, 1937, FDR addresses the nation in his second inaugural address, stating, I see one third of the nation ill-housed, ill-clad, ill-nourished. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Powerful words. 1939, in the fall, the rain comes, finally bringing an end to the drought. During the next few years, with the coming of World War II, the country is pulled out of the depression and the plains once again become golden with wheat. Watch the last part of Wizard of Oz when Dorothy is back in Kansas and she sings Over the Rainbow. I think that song in some ways embodies 1939 when the rains finally come and the crops grow once again and rainbows shine. Here's a map showing the states that were affected by the Dust Bowl. A very small part of Nebraska, western Kansas, northwestern Oklahoma, the panhandle of Texas, New Mexico, um, upper east, northeast, and Colorado, um, the southeast um, corner of Colorado. And you'll see the darker regions is where um, it was most affected, right? 
It's a large landmass of the American nation. I'd like to go back and cover um, the Homestead Act. President Lincoln in 1862 signs a Homestead Act, which opens up this large expanse of territory for new um, American um, settlements and homesteading, which, which gave Americans, newly arrived immigrants, women, African Americans, land um, in order to populate this, this westward moving nation. In May, of, May, May 20th, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signs a Homestead Act, which provided 160 acres for a very small fee. Immigrants, women, and ex-slaves all took advantage of the act, heading into the Midwest to claim their lands. Four million claims were submitted, one six point million deeds obtained, 270 million acres settled, or 10% of US land through the Homestead Act. It lasted 124 years until its repeal in 1976. And many of these people in, in the Dust Bowl region can trace um, their roots back to the Homestead Act. And this is how most of this region is populated um, from 1862 onward. Here are some images of homesteaders. Of course, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands, perhaps thousands of images. But here's one, um, a photo of a homestead family posed outdoors in Minnesota, claiming their land. Another homestead farm, a photo of a Finnish family, an immigrant family, right? Many Northern Europeans came as homesteaders to homestead, Sweden, Denmark, 1900, another homestead family in the Midwest. Here's, here are a few quotes from a book that you can buy on Amazon um, by Lawrence Svoboda, who was the author. From, his book is entitled Farming the Dust Bowl, a first-hand account from Kansas. And I just want to read um, a few quotes from the book, from this first-hand accounts, and I, I encourage you to buy the book. He says, I believe any man must see the beauty in mile upon mile of level land where the wheat waist high sways to the slightest breeze and is turning a golden yellow under a flaming July sun. To me, it is breathtaking, the most beautiful scene in all the world. This is before the Dust Bowl when farmers in the Midwest and Southern Plains could look out and see miles and miles and miles of gold and wheat swaying in the, wind, in the breeze. Beautiful. With the gales came the dust. Sometimes it was so thick that it completely hid the sun. Visibility ranged from nothing to 50 feet. The former when the eyes were filled with dirt, which could not be avoided even with goggles. When I knew that my crop was irrevocably gone, I experienced a deathly feeling, which I hope can affect a man only once in a lifetime. My dreams and ambitions had been flouted by nature and my shattered ideals seemed gone forever. The very desire to make a success of my life was gone. The spirit and urge to strive were dead within me. Fate had dealt me a cruel blow Above, above which I felt utterly unable to rise. Beautiful, powerful, sad words. At other times, a cloud is seen to be approaching from a distance of many miles. Already, it has the, blank, the bank appearance of a cumulus cloud, but it is, a, it is black instead of white, and it hangs low seeming to hug the earth. Instead of being slow to change, it, change its form, it appears to be rolling on itself from the crest downward. As it sweeps onward, the landscape is progressively blotted out. Birds fly in terror before the storm, and only those that are strong of wind may escape. The smaller birds fly until they are exhausted, then fall to the ground to share the fate the thousands of jackrabbits which perish from suffocation. 
a powerful photo right here. Right? Kids head to school with goggles and dust masks. I love this photo, it's powerful. The doctors of our region know that the dust endangers the life of anyone whose health is impaired from disease, and that it is often the direct cause of the deaths of people previously strong and healthy. There are many victims who, because of poverty or prejudice, never go to the hospital. And many patients who are taken there at last by relatives are moribund when admitted and die within a few hours. The dust I had labored in all day began to show its effect on my system. My head ached, my stomach was upset, and my lungs were oppressed and felt as if they must contain a ton of fine dirt. So the dust bowl had taught us another lesson, namely that bare ground exposed to the sun will transform warm breezes into fiery blasts. The hot wind seemed to rob all vegetation of its vitality. This was my first experience of a wind that caused my face to blister so that the skin peeled off. Every day I scanned the sky, looking for signs of the rain that would save my wheat from ruin. One after another, Neighbors saw their crops reach a condition beyond, beyond hope of salvage. With my financial resources at last exhausted and my health seriously, if not permanently impaired, I am at last ready to admit defeat and leave the dust bowl forever. With youth and ambition ground into the very dust itself, I can only drift with the tide. And here we see a photo of a family walking to California. Here's a powerful photo from the Dust Bowl, a father with his children, and there's a wife in back hiding her face for some reason. Three children, four children, three boys and a girl. I want you to look into the face of the father. And what, what do you see in his face? If you were to describe his face in one word, perhaps three words, what words would you use to describe his face? Look into his eyes. Despair. Tired, exhausted, exhausted in a way with life, with knowing that exhausted from hopelessness, I think. These are hardworking people. These are farmers who own their own land, who had their own livestock, whose farms perhaps have been in their family since 1862, this is 1870s, 1880s, third and fourth generation homesteaders, proud people, strong people who lost everything. And their livestock are all dead, their crops are ruined, they have to leave. And they're headed to California to work in the fields as migrant laborers when they'd once been farmers and landowners. And you can see this in this man's face, this despair. He has a family to feed. And probably no work. He's probably broke, very little money. How does he feed these kids? Here's a sign as Okies enter California. <laughs> no jobs in California. If you're looking for work, keep out. Six men for every job. And th these are signs for white Americans from Oklahoma, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, looking for work, looking to feed their families. I'd like to read a few excerpts from John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. Chapter one, 
to the red country and part of the gray country of Oklahoma, the last rains came gently, and it did not cut the scarred earth. The plows crossed and recrossed the rivulet marks. The last rains lifted the corn quickly and scattered weed colonies and grass along the sides of the roads so that the gray country and the dark red country began to disappear under a green cover. In the last part of May, the sky grew pale and the clouds that had hung in high puffs for so long in the spring were dissipated. The sun flared down on the growing corn day after day until a line of brown spread along the edge of each green bayonet. The clouds appeared and went away. And in a while they did not try any more. The weeds grew darker green to protect themselves and they did not spread any more. The surface of the earth crusted, a thin hard crust. And as the sky became pale, so the earth became pale. Pink in the red country and white in the gray country. In the water cut gullies, the earth dusted down in dry little streams. Gophers and ant lions started small avalanches. And as a sharp sun struck day after day, the leaves of the small, the leaves of the young corn became less stiff and erect. They bent in a curve at first, and then as the central ribs of strength grew weak, each leaf tilted downward. Then it was June, and the sun shone more fiercely. The brown lines on the corn leaves widened and moved in on the central ribs. The weeds frayed and edged back toward their roots. The air was thin and the sky more pale, and every day the earth paled. In the roads where the teams moved, where the wheels milled the ground and the hooves of the horses beat the ground, the dirt crust broke and the dust formed. Every morning, sorry, every moving thing lifted the dust into the air. A walking man lifted a thin layer as high as his waist, and a wagon lifted the dust as high as the fence tops, and an automobile boiled a cloud behind it. The dust was long in settling back again. When June was half gone, the big clouds moved up out of Texas in the Gulf with high heavy clouds, weighing heads. The men in the fields looked up at the clouds and sniffed at them and held wet fingers up to sense the wind. And the horses were nervous while the clouds were up. The rain heads dropped a little, spattering, and hurried on to some other country. Behind them, the sky was pale again, and the sun flared. In the dust, there were drop craters where the rain had fallen, and there were clean splashes on the corn, and that was all. A gentle wind followed the rain clouds, driving them on northward. A wind that softly clashed the drying corn. A day went by and the wind increased, steady, unbroken by gusts. The dust from the roads fluffed up and spread out and fell on the weeds beside the fields and fell into the fields a little way. Now the wind grew strong and hard and it worked at the rain crust in the cornfields. Little by little, the sky was darkened by the mixing dust and the wind felt over the earth and loosened the dust and carried it away. The wind grew stronger. The rain crust broke and the dust lifted up out of the fields and drove gray plumes into the air like sluggish smoke. The corn threshed the wind and made a dry rushing sound. The finest dust did not settle back to the earth now, but disappeared into the darkening sky. The wind grew stronger, whisked under stones, carried up straws and old leaves and even little clods, making its course as it sailed across the fields. 
The air in the sky darkened, and through them the sun shone redly, and there was a raw sting in the air. During a night when the wind raced faster over the land, dug cunningly among the rootless of, rootlets of the corn, and the corn fought the wind with its weakened leaves until the roots were freed by the prying wind, and then each stalk settled wearily sideways toward the earth and pointed the direction of the wind. The dawn came, but no day. In the gray sky, a red, a red sun appeared, a dim red circle that gave a little light like dusk. And as that day advanced, the dusk slipped back toward darkness. And the wind cried and whimpered over the fallen corn. Men and women huddled in their homes and they tied handkerchiefs over their noses when they went out and wore goggles to protect their eyes. When the night came again, it was black night for the stars could not pierce the dust to get down and the window lights could not even spread beyond their own yards. Now the dust was evenly mixed with the air in emulsion of dust and air. Houses were shut tight and cloth wedged around doors and windows. But the dust came in so thinly that it could not be seen in the air and it settled like pollen on the chairs and tables, on the dishes. The people brushed it from their shoulders, little lines of dust at the door sills. In the middle of that night, the wind passed on and left the land quiet. The dust-filled air muffled sound more completely than fog does. The people lying in their beds heard the wind stop. They awakened when the rushing wind was gone. They lay quietly and listened deep into the stillness. Then the roosters crowed and their voices were muffled and the people stirred restlessly in their beds and wanted the morning. They knew it would take a long time for the dust to settle out of the air. In the morning, the dust hung like fog, and the sun was as red, as ripe as new blood. All the day, the dust sifted down from the sky, and the next day, it sifted down. An even blanket covered the earth. It settled on the corn, piled up on the tops of fence posts, piled up on the wires, it settled on roofs, blanketed the weeds and trees. The people came out of their houses and smelled the hot stinging air and covered their noses from it. And the children came out of their houses, but they did not run or shout as they would have done after a rain. Men stood by their fences and looked at the ruined corn. Drying fast now, only a little green showing from the film of dust. The men were silent and they did not move often. And the women came out of the houses to stand beside their men. To feel whether this time, this time the men would break. The women studied the men's faces secretly, for the corn could go as long as something else remained. The children stood by, drawing figures in the dust with bare toes, and the children sent exploring senses out to see whether men and women, whether men and women would break. The children peeked at the faces of the men and women, and they drew careful lines in the dust with their toes. Horses came to the water, watering troughs and nuzzled the water to clear the surface dust. After a while, the faces of the watching men lost their bemused perplexity and became hard and angry and resistant. Then the women knew that they were safe, that there was no break. Then they asked, what do we do? And the men replied, 
I don't know. But it was all right. The women knew it was all right. And the watching children knew it was all right. Women and children knew deep in themselves that no misfortune was too great to bear if their men were whole. The women went into the houses to their work and the children began to play, but cautiously at first. As the day went forward, the sun became less red. It flared down on the dust blanketed earth. The men, the men sat in the doorways of their houses. Their hands were busy with sticks and little rocks. The men sat still, thinking, figuring. Chapter five. The owners of the land came onto the land or more often a spokesman for the owners came. They came and closed the cars and they felt the dry earth with their fingers. And sometimes they drove big earth augers into the ground for soil tests. The tenants from their sun beaten door yards watched uneasily when the closed cars drove along the fields. And at last the owner man drove into the door yards and sat in their cars to talk out of the windows. The tenant man stood beside the cars for a while and then squatted on their hams and found sticks with which to mark the dust. In the open doors, the women stood looking out and behind them, the children, corn headed children with wide eyes, one bare foot on top of the other bare foot and the toes working. The women and the children watched their man talking to the owner men. They were silent. Some of the owner men were kind because they hated what they had to do. And some of them were angry because they hated to be cruel. And some of them were cold because they had long ago found that one could not be an owner unless, unless one was cold and all of them were caught in something larger than themselves. Some of them hated the mathematics that drove them, and some were afraid, and some worshiped the mathematics because it provided a refuge from thought and from feeling. If a bank or finance company owned the land, the owner man said, the bank or the company needs wants, insist, must have, as though the bank or the company were a monster with thought and feeling, which had ensnared them. These last would take no responsibility for the banks or the companies because they were men and slaves, while the banks were machines and masters all at the same time. Some of the owner men were a little proud to be slaves to such cold and powerful masters. The owner men sat in the cars and explained, you know the land is poor. You scrabbled at it long enough, God knows. The squatting tenant man nodded and wondered and drew figures in the dust. And yes, they knew, God knows. If the dust only wouldn't fly, if the top would only stay on the soil, it might not be so bad. The owner men went, the owner men went on leading to their point. You know the land's getting poorer. You know what cotton does to the land? Robs it, sucks all the blood out of it. The squatters nodded. They knew, God knew, if they could only rotate the crops, they might pump blood back into the land. Well, it's too late. And the owner man explained the workings and the thinkings of the monster that was stronger than they were. And a man can, a man can hold land if he can just eat and pay taxes. He can do that. Yes, he can do that until his crops fail one day and he has to borrow money from the bank. But you see, 
a bank, a company can't do that because those creatures don't breathe air, don't eat side meat. They breathe profits. They eat the interest on money. If they don't get it, they die the way you die without air, without side meat. It's a sad thing, but it is so. It is just so. The squatting men raise their eyes to understand. Can't we just hang on? Maybe the next year will be a good year. God knows how much cotton next year. And with all the wars, God knows what price cotton will bring. Don't they make explosives out of cotton and uniforms? Get enough wars and cotton hit the ceiling. Next year, maybe. They looked up questioningly. We can't depend on that. The bank, the monster has to have profits all the time. It can't wait. It'll die. No taxes go on. When the monster stops growing, it dies. It can't stay one size. Soft fingers begin to tap the sill of the car window and hard fingers tightened on the restless drawing sticks. In the doorways of the sun-beaten tenant houses, women sighed and then shifted feet so that the one that had been down was now on top and the toes working. Dogs came sniffing near the owner cars and wetted in on all four tires one after another. And chickens lay in the sunny dust and fluffed their feathers to get cleansing dust down to the skin. In the little styes, the pigs grunted inquiringly over the muddy remnants of the slops. The squatting man looked down again. What do you want us to do? We can't take less share of the crop. We're half starved now. The kids are hungry all the time. We got no clothes, torn and ragged. If all the neighbors weren't the same, we'd be ashamed to go to a meeting. And at last the owner man came to the point. The tenant system won't work anymore. One man on a tractor can take the place of 12 or 14 families, pay him a wage and take all the crop. We have to do it, we have to do it. We don't like to do it, but the monster's sick. Something's happened to the monster. But you'll kill the land with cotton. We know. We got to take cotton quick before the land dies. Then we'll sell the land. Lots of families in the East would like to own a piece of this land. The tenant man looked up alarmed. But what happened to us? How will we eat? You'll have to get off the land. The plows go through the doorway, dooryard. And now the squatting man stood up angrily. Grandpa took up the land and he had to kill the Indians and drive them away. And Paul was born here and he killed weeds and snakes. Then, it, then a bad year came and he had to borrow a little money and he was born here. There in the door, our children born here. And Pa had to borrow money. The bank owned the land then. But we stayed and we got a little bit of what we raised. We all know that. All that. It's not us, it's the bank. A bank isn't like a man or an owner with 50,000 acres. He isn't like a man either. That's the monster. Sure, cried the tenant man, but it's our land. We measured it, we measured it and broke it up. We were, we were born on it and we, we got killed on it, died on it. Even if it's no good, it's, it's still ours. That's what makes it ours, being born on it, working it, dying on it. That makes ownership, not a paper with numbers on it. 
We're sorry. It's not us. It's the monster. The bank isn't like a man. Yes, but the bank is only made of men. No, you're wrong there. Quite wrong there. The bank is something else than men. It happens that every man in a bank hates what the bank does, and yet the bank doesn't. The bank is something more than men, I tell you. It's the monster. Men made it, but they can't control it. The tenants cried, Grandpa killed Indians, Pa killed, pa killed snakes for the land. Maybe we can kill the banks. They're worse than Indians and snakes. Maybe we, maybe we got to fight to keep our lands like Pa and Grandpa did. And now the owner man grew angry. You'll have to go. But it's ours, the tenant man cried. We know the bank. The monster owns it. You'll have to go. We'll get our guns. Like Grandpa, when the Indians came, what then? Well, first the sheriff and then the troops. You'll be stealing if you try to stay. You'll be murderers if you kill to stay. The monster isn't men, but it can make men do what it wants. But if we go, where will we go? How will we go? We got no money. We're sorry, said the owner man. The bank, the 50,000 acre owner can't be responsible. You're on land that isn't yours. Once over the line, maybe you'll pick cotton in the fall. Maybe you can go on relief, on welfare. Why don't you go out west to California? There's work there and it never gets cold. Why, you can reach out anywhere and pick an orange. Why, there's always some kind of crop to work in. Why don't you go out there? And the owner man started their cars and rolled away. The tenant men squatted down on their hams again to mark the dust with a stick, to figure, to wonder. Their sunburned faces were dark and their sun-whipped eyes were light. The women moved cautiously out of the doorways toward their men. And the children crept behind them women, cautiously, ready to run. The bigger boys squatted besides their fathers because that made them men. After a time, the women asked, what did he want? And the man looked up for a second and a smolder of pain was in their eyes. We got to get off. A tractor and a superintendent, like factories. Where'll we go? The woman asked. We don't know, we don't know. And the women went quietly, quickly, back into the houses and headed the children ahead of them. They knew that a man was so hurt and so perplexed may turn in anger, even on people he loves. They left the man alone to figure and to wonder in the dust. After a time, perhaps the tenant man looked about at the pump put in 10 years ago with a gooseneck handle and iron flowers on the spout at the chopping block where a thousand chickens had been killed at the hand plow lying in the shed and the patent crib hanging in the rafters over it. The children crowded about the women in the houses. What are we gonna do, Ma? Where are we gonna go? The women said, we don't know yet. Go out and play. But don't go near your father. He might wail if you go near him. And the women went on with their work. But all the time they watched the men squatting in the dust, perplexed, figuring. The tractors came over the roads into the fields. 
Great crawlers moving like insects, having the incredible strength of insects. They crawled over the ground, laying the track and rolling on it and picking, up, picking it up. Diesel tractors, puttering while they stood idle. They thundered when they moved and then settled down to a droning roar. Snub-nosed monsters, raising the dust and stick, sticking their snouts into it. Straight down the country, across the country, through fences, through dooryards, in and out of goalies, in straight lines. They did not run on the ground, but on their own roadbeds. They ignored hills and gulches, watercourses, fences, houses. The man sitting in the iron seat did not look like a man, gloved, goggled, rubber dusk mask over nose and mouth. He was part of the monster, a robot in the seat. The thunder of the cylinders sounded through the country, became one with the air and the earth, so that the air and earth muttered in sympathetic vibration. The driver could not control it. Straight across country it went, cutting through a dozen farms and straight back. A twitch at the controls could swerve the cat, but the driver's hands could not twitch because the monster that built the tractor, the monster that sent the tractor out, had somehow gotten the driver's hands into his brain and muscle, had goggled him and muzzled him, goggled his mind, muzzled his speech, goggled his perception muzzled his protest. He could not see the land as it was. He could not smell the land as it smelled. His feet could not stamp the clods or feel the warmth and power of the earth. He sat in an iron seat and stepped on iron pedals. He could not cheer or beat or curse or encourage the extension of his power. And because of this, he could not cheer or whip or curse or encourage himself. He did not know or own or trust or beseech the land. If a seed dropped, did not germinate, there was no skin off his ass. If the young thrusting plant withered in drought or dried in a flood of rain, it was no more to the driver than to the tractor. He loved the land no more than the bank loved the land. He could not admire the tractor, its machine surfaces. Sorry. He could, he could admire the tractor, its machine surfaces, its surge of power, the roar of its detonating cylinders, but it was not his tractor. Behind the tractor rolled the shining disks, cutting the earth with blades, not plowing but surgery pushing the cut earth to the right where the second row of discs cut it and push it to the left, slicing blades shining, polished by the cut earth, and pulled behind the discs, the harrows combing with iron teeth so that the little clods broke up and the earth lay smooth. Behind the harrows, the long cedars, 12 curved iron pans erected in the foundry, orgasms, set by gears, raping methodically, raping without passion. The driver sat in his iron seat and he was proud of the straight lines he did not will, proud of the tractor he did not own or love, proud of the power he could not control. And when the crop grew and was harvested, no man had crumbled a hot clawed in his fingers and let the earth sift past his fingertips. No man had touched the seed or lusted for the growth. Men ate what they had not raised, had, had no connection with the bread. The land bore under iron and under iron gradually died for it was not loved or hated. It had no prayer or curses. At noon, the tractor driver stopped sometimes near a tenant house 
and opened his lunch. Sandwiches wrapped in wax paper, white bread, pickle, cheese, spam, a piece of pie branded like an iron, like an engine part. He ate without relish. And tenants not yet moved away came out to see him. Looked curiously while the goggles were taken off and the rubber dust mask, leaving white circles around the eyes and a large white circle around nose and mouth. The exhaust of the tracker, the exhaust of the tractor puttered on, for fuel was so cheap it is more efficient to leave the engine running than to heat the diesel nose for a new start. Cautious children crowded close, ragged children who ate their fried dough as they watched. They watched hungrily, hungrily, the unwrapping of the sandwiches, and their hunger sharpened noses smelled the pickle, cheese, and spam. They didn't speak to the driver. They watched his hand as it carried food to his mouth. They did not watch him chewing. They did not watch him chewing. Their eyes followed the hand that held the sandwich. After a while, the tenant who could not leave the place came out and squatted in the shade beside the tractor. Why, you're Joe Davis's boy. Sure, the driver said. Well, what you doing this kind of work for? against your own people. Three dollars a day. I got damn sick of keeping for my dinner and not getting it. I got a wife and kids. We got to eat. Three dollars a day and it comes every day. That's right, the tenant said. But for your three dollars a day, 15 or 20 families can't eat at all. Nearly a hundred people have to go out and wander the roads for your three dollars a day, is that right? And the driver said, can't think of that. Got to think of my own kids. Three dollars a day and it comes every day. Times are changing. Mister, don't you know? Can't make a living on the land unless you've got two, five, ten thousand acres in a tractor. Crop land isn't for little guys like us anymore. Right? Those families who would come during Lincoln's Homestead Act and after um, small family farms, the type of yeoman farmers Thomas Jefferson had imagined would populate America. Family, fo educated family farmers, self-sufficient, growing their own crops. Um, but this, this tractor driver is saying times are changing. Jefferson's in America is gone. The homesteaders who own family farms are a thing of the past. This is what the tractor driver is saying. Crop land is for little guys like us anymore. Well, it isn't for little guys like us anymore. You don't kick up a howl because you can't make Fords because you're not the telephone company. Well, crops are like that now. Nothing, nothing to do about it. You try to get $3 a day someplace. That's the only way. The tenant pondered. Funny thing how it is. If a man owns a little property, that property is him. It's part of him. And it's like him. If he owns property only so he can walk on it and handle it and be sad when it isn't doing well and feel fine when the rain's following it, that property is him. And some way... He's bigger because he owns it. Even if he isn't successful, he's big with his property. That is so. And the tenant pondered more. But let a man get property he doesn't see or can't take time to get his fingers in or can't be there to walk on it. Why, then the, prop, then the property is the man. He can't do what he wants. He can't think what he wants. The property is the man stronger than he is. And he is small, not big. Only his possessions are big. And he's a servant of the property. That is so too. The driver munched the branded pie 
and threw the crust away. Times are changing, don't you know? Thinking about stuff like that don't feed the kids. Get your $3 a day, feed your kids. You've got no call to worry about anybody's kids but your own. You get a reputation for talking like that, and you'll never get $3 a day. Big shots won't give you $3 a day if you worry about anything but your own $3 a day. Nearly 100 people on the road for your $3. Where will we go? And that reminds me, the driver said, you better get out soon. I'm going through that dooryard after dinner. You filled in the well this morning. I know, had to keep the line straight. But I'm going through the dooryard after dinner. Got to keep the line straight. And well, you know Joe Davis, my old man, so I'll tell you this. I got orders wherever there's a family not moved out. If I have an accident, you know, get too close and cave in and keep the house in a little, well, I might get a couple of dollars. And my youngest kid has had no shoes yet. I built it with my hands, straightened old nails to put the sheathing on. Rafters are wired on the stringers with balling wire. It's mine. I built it. You bump it down, I'll be in the window with a rifle. You even come close, too close, and I'll pot you like a rabbit. It's not me. There's nothing I can do. I'll lose my job if I don't do it. And look, suppose you kill me, they'll just hang you. But long before you're hung, there'll be another guy in the tractor. And he'll bump the house down. You're not killing the right guy. Well, that's so, the tenant said. Who gave you orders? I'll go after him. He's the one to kill. You're wrong. He got his orders from the bank. The bank told him, clear those people out or it's your job. Well, there's a president of the bank. There's a board of directors. I'll fill up the magazine of the rifle and go into the bank, the driver said. Fellow was telling me the bank gets orders from the east. The orders were, make the land show profit or we'll close you up. But where does it stop? Who can we shoot? I don't aim to starve to death before I kill a man that's starving me. I don't know, maybe there's nobody to shoot. Maybe the thing isn't meant at all. Maybe like you said, the property is doing it. Anyway, I told you my orders. I got the figure, the tenant said. We all got the figure. There's some way to stop this. It's not like lightning or earthquakes. We've got a bad thing made by men. And by God, that's something we can change. The tenant sat in the doorway and the driver thundered his engine and started off. Tracks falling and curving, harrows combing, and the foul eye of the cedar slipping into the ground. Across the dooryard, the tractor cuts, and the hard, foot-beaten ground with seeded fields, and the tractor cut through again. The uncut space was 10 feet wide, and back he came. The iron guard bit into the house corner crumbled the wall and wrenched the little house from its foundation so that it fell sideways, crushed like a bug. And the driver was goggled and a rubber mask covered his nose and mouth. The tractor cut a straight line and the air and the ground vibrated with its thunder. The tenant man stared after it, his rifle in his hand. His wife was beside him and the quiet children behind and all of them stared after the tractor. My friends, I have been on a journey of husbandry. I went primarily to see at first hand conditions in the drought state. 
You see how effectively federal and local authorities are taking care of pressing problems of relief, and also how they are to work together to defend the people of this country against the effects of future drought. I saw drought devastation in nine states. I talked with families who had lost their wheat crop, lost their corn crop, lost their livestock, lost the water in their well, lost their garden, and come through to the end of the summer without one dollar of cash resources, facing the winter without feed or food, facing a planting season without seed to put in the ground. That was the extreme case. But there are thousands and thousands of families on Western farms who share the same difficulties. I saw cattlemen who, because of lack of grass or lack of winter feed, have been compelled to sell all but their breeding stock and will need help to carry even these through the coming winter. I saw livestock kept alive only because water had been brought to them long distances in tank cars. I saw other farm families who have not lost everything, but who, because they have made only partial crops, must have some form of help if they are to continue farming next spring. I shall never forget the fields of wheat, so blasted by heat that they cannot be harvested. I shall never forget field after field of corn, stunted, earless, stripped of leaves, for what the sun left, the grasshoppers took. I saw brown pasture that would not keep a cow on 50 acres. Yet I would not have you think for a single minute that there is permanent disaster in these drought regions or that the picture I saw meant depopulating these areas. No cracked earth, no blistering sun, no burning wind, no grasshoppers are a permanent match for the indomitable American farmers and stockmen and their wives and children who have carried on through desperate days and inspire us with their self-reliance, their tenacity, and their courage.